Ezekiel chapter 33, we have four, counting tonight, we have four more uh, classes on Ezekiel. And if you're reading the text with me, you know why we're covering three or four chapters at a time. Ezekiel can be pretty repetitive, and I don't see the, the need in a class setting to read every single verse when he says the same thing several times. But you know, if you listen to one of my sermons, and you pay, pay really close attention, in fact, if you listen to the recording, you back up and replay it, back up and replay it, you'll notice that I repeat myself too. So that's just the way preachers are. So that's what Ezekiel does. So tonight plus three more uh, Wednesday nights, and I'll present an, kind of an outline of what the rest of the book of Ezekiel is about uh, in just a moment. Remember that Ezekiel, Ezekiel is a priest. At the age of 30, when he normally would have started his service as a priest, he gets carried into a foreign country. He gets carried into exile by the Babylonians as a part of the punishment from God on all of Israel because of idolatry primarily, as well as uh, not respecting and obeying the law of Moses, immorality and, and, and other sins. In the process of him being carried off into exile, of course, God calls him to be a prophet. Now, prophets were preachers who got their message directly from God. I don't get my message directly from God. It takes a few minutes for me to write a sermon. Ezekiel got his message directly from God. But other than that, basically, he's just a preacher, calling his people back to faithfulness to God. Now, if you look in chapter 33 is where we're going to start tonight. If you notice in verse 21, Ezekiel tells us the date that he hears the news that the city of Jerusalem, their capital city with their temple, has been destroyed. It has been overrun. It has been overtaken by the Babylonians. Again, that was because Israel forsook God. They started worshiping false gods. And when you worship any god you want to, you can live any way you want to. And that does not honor God. So at this point... For the most part, the rest of the book of Ezekiel is more optimism than pessimism. The first 32 chapters were more pessimism than optimism. It was, it was all about the sins of Israel and how they violated the nature of God and the Word of God. And, and so that's the reason why all of these things has fallen on them. But from here, once, once the temple fell and Israel did not repent of their sins, and so God followed through with what he had what he had uh, threatened, the temple was destroyed and this capital city fell. And so that, from that point on, for the most part, Ezekiel turns his attention towards a word of, of hope and encouragement. So here is how the rest of the book of Ezekiel looks. Israel needs a watchman. That's here in chapter 33, and we're going to go through chapter 33 in just a moment. And Ezekiel is him. Ezekiel is God's spokesman. And then in chapter 34, God is going to critique the shepherds, the leaders of Israel, because they were not taking care of the sheep. They were more concerned about themselves. And so God is going to criticize the, the, uh, the shepherds, the leaders. And then the next chapter, chapter 35, which is the last chapter we'll look at tonight, the Edomites, and you remember that Ezekiel critiqued, rebuked the Edomites back in chapter 25, the Edomites lived just to the south of Israel, around the Dead Sea area. Well, when Babylon invaded Israel, Edom helped Babylon in some way, but then Edom also kind of moved into the territory, and they assumed the land of Israel for themselves, and we're going to see that in chapter 35. And so God is going to rebuke Edom. The next two chapters are going to be next week, and I'll be gone next week. I'll be holding a gospel meeting at Rolling Hills uh, Congregation in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. So Josh is going to teach those two chapters. So chapters 36 and 37 are next week. In chapter 36, God uh, tells Israel that he's going to bless them and he's going to renew them. He's going to bring them back from Babylon back to Israel, to the land of, of Canaan, the, the promised land. And then in chapter 37, 
Ezekiel pictures that return as a resurrection. The vision of the valley of dry bones, the resurrection. That is a picture of the return from exile to the promised land, chapter 37. Then when I come back from Kentucky, chapters 38 and 39 are the, pro the prophecy of Gog and Magog. Gog from Magog. You recognize that from the book of Revelation, chapter 20. We'll talk some about that because we're going to spend the time talking about Gog from Magog. And we'll have to touch on the book of Revelation because people lose their common sense when they look at Revelation chapter 20. So we'll talk about that. And then our last class together, we're going to cover nine chapters. And when you read Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, you're going to understand why we're going to cover all nine chapters in one class. Because it's about the new temple. But that new temple is not a literal temple. There's lots of indications in the text that show us that it's not a literal temple. So then our question is, what does that perfect temple symbolize? What is it a metaphor for? There's three spiritual temples mentioned in the New Testament. And we'll talk about that when we cover chapters 40 through 48. So, let's back up to chapter 33. Look at the text in front of you, and Ezekiel says that the word of the Lord came to me, and he said, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people, which is just another way of saying the Israelites, and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one man from among them, and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land, and he blows the trumpet, and he warns the people. Now notice how many times Ezekiel uses that word warning here. In, chapter, in verse 3, in verse 4, in verse 5 twice, and in verse 6. Warn, warn, warn. So verse 3, he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. Then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning. He hears the sound of the trumpet, but he doesn't do anything about it. And a sword comes and takes him away. His blood will be on his own head. Every man is responsible for his own reaction to Jesus Christ. Every one of us are going to be judged based on our own unique, personal response to Jesus Christ. So here, this man, is, his blood is going to be on his own head if he hears the warning and he doesn't do anything about it. Verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But notice verse 6. Here is the threat to Ezekiel. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Notice in verse 7, God says, As for you, son of man, Ezekiel, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel so that you will hear a message, literally the Hebrew says, a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Family, this principle right here emphasizes to me and you that when somebody asks us a Bible question, we better quote God. And we need to quote Him in context. Satan can quote Scripture, right? But he pulled Scripture out of context. So we have to make sure that when we are sharing with people what the Word of God teaches, that we quote God, book, chapter, and verse, and make sure that we're using that book, chapter, and verse in the way that God intended for it to be used. Now, in the rest of this section, and when you read this section, it should sound familiar to you because it's basically the same thing God has already told Israel back in Ezekiel chapter 18. Okay, so verse 9. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. 
But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. We are responsible for teaching the truth. We are responsible for uh, sowing the seed. We are not responsible how, for how people respond. And in essence, that's what Paul means in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17 when he says, God did not send me to baptize but to preach. The people in Corinth were, were responding improperly. Some of them saying, I'm, I'm a follower of Paul and I'm a follower of, of Apollos and I'm a follower of Cephas and I'm a follower of Christ. That all was not, not right. Paul says, my responsibility is to preach the gospel. Here, God tells Ezekiel, your responsibility is to share the alarm. And so in verse 10, as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you have spoken, saying, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? When somebody comes forward on a Sunday morning, in essence, that's what their question is. I am rotting away in my sin. How am I going to survive? So God's response in verse 11 says, As I live, declares the Lord. Now that's oath language. Anytime you, hear, you see the words, as I live, God is swearing an oath. Now God swears an oath by his own nature. But that's, that's, that's his way of emphasizing. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Repent, repent, repent. Stop living for yourself. Stop living a sinful life. Stop violating my law. Stop violating my nature. If you want to live, if you don't want to rot in your sins, stop practicing sin. And that's why God's given us a Bible. That's why God's given us the New Testament, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, so we'll know what Jesus expects. It's no secret. We just have to read. The rest of, of chapter 33, or pretty much the next several 10 or 15 verses, is that same message over and over again. And so then we come down to verse 21, and verse 21 is that message. In the twelfth year of our exile, on the fifth of the tenth month, the refugees from Jerusalem came to me saying, the city has been taken. Jerusalem is destroyed. Our temple is destroyed. We can only imagine what it would feel like to hear that your capital city is controlled by your enemy. Last week I used the example of, of the Chinese invading and taking over Washington, D.C. How would it make you feel to know that you're, you, all of your buildings are overtaken by, by foreigners? And in fact, they invade Swartz Creek. I don't know why the Chinese would want Swartz Creek, but they invade Swartz Creek, and they come in here and they set up a Buddhist temple right here in the, in the middle of our church building, in our auditorium. That would be the equivalent of the Babylonians invading and destroying the temple of God in Jerusalem. The place where they met to worship. It was even worse for them because they held the, the temple in such high esteem. Whereas we understand this is just a building and what a church. But we get an idea of, of how it would impact them and how it would affect their heart. After this, verse 22 Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord had been upon me in the evening before the refugees came, and he opened my mouth at the time they came to me in the morning, so my mouth was open and I was no longer speechless. God had told Ezekiel to be speechless back in chapter 24. Now, when we read this text, we're like, he sure has done a whole lot of talking for somebody who's been speechless. We don't know exactly how to interpret this. The commentators I've read suggest that uh, what God was doing was limiting where he could preach from his house, perhaps, uh, rather than in some kind of public forum. But from this point on, apparently, he's able to speak more publicly. Maybe that's how we understand it. Beginning in verse 25, 23, 
God quotes the, the Israelites, basically, verse 24, they who live in these waste places in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, yet he possessed the land. So to us who are many, the land has been given as a possession. These people who are living in Babylon are still saying, the, land, the promised land belongs to us. They have been booted out, and yet they still say the land belongs to us. In other words, some of them haven't learned their lesson yet. And, and so, in verse 25, God says, You eat meat with blood in it. In other words, you violated the law of Moses. You lift up your eyes to the idols as you shed blood. You violated the law of Moses. Should you then possess the land? Do you deserve to live in the promised land when you're worshiping idols? Verse 26, you rely on your sword. The verb to rely means to trust. You trust your sword. What were they doing? They were trusting their military rather than God. You commit abominations, which is probably a reference to idol worship. And each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. You're committing sexual immorality. And then you say, should you, should you then possess the land? Why do you deserve the promised land when you've been violating my law left and right? Stick your finger here in Ezekiel chapter 33 and turn back to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 24 through 29. So we're going all the way back to Mount Sinai. When God first created Israel as a nation of people and he gave them his law and he said you're going to be a kingdom of priests to me and you need to keep yourself holy and you need to keep my, my statutes and my laws and my, my commandments and if you do that you will live. If you don't do it let's read what he says Leviticus 18 beginning in verse 24. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore I brought its punishment upon it, so the land has spewed out its inhabitants. The land has vomited out its inhabitants because they were guilty of immorality. Verse 26, But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments, and you shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out should you defile it, as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people." So all the way back at Mount Sinai, when Israel became a nation at the very first time, this was their July 4, 70, 1776 date, God was warning them, I'm kicking the, the Canaanites out of the land before you, and I'm giving you their land because they're committing idolatry and immorality. If you move in the land and you start doing the same thing, the land's going to vomit you out too. So now we fast forward a thousand years pretty much a thousand years to the time of Ezekiel here in chapter 33 and Ezekiel is saying you don't deserve the land because of all of your immorality and your idolatry. Notice in verse 28 he says I will make the land a desolation and a waste and the pride of her power will cease. We saw that expression pride of power remember before back with Egypt especially. Verse 30, but as for you, son of man, your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and in the doorways of the houses, speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, come now and hear what the message is which comes forth from the Lord. So these Israelites, they're still Israelites who are coming to Ezekiel. And they're even verbalizing the idea that Ezekiel is sharing a message from God. Let's go talk to the preacher and see what he has to say. But, verse 31, they come to you as people come and sit before you as my people and hear your words. But they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth and their heart goes after their gain. 
Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not practice them. It's like going to a concert. You go to a concert to listen to somebody sing and you enjoy it and you go away and your life's not changed. The last concert Rachel and I went to was a country music group Alabama in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're going to go hear them in Detroit in 2020 and it got canceled. We're going to go hear them in Grand Rapids in 2021 and it got canceled. So then Rachel got on their website and found out they were going to Raleigh, North Carolina one day before I was going down there to hold a gospel meeting. So you just leave a day early. We should have got a prize for traveling the farthest to get to this concert. But after this three-hour concert, we walked out of there and our hearts weren't changed. Our lives weren't changed. We enjoyed the music, but the message was not from God. That's how these people were doing when they came to Ezekiel. And they even said that Ezekiel's words were from God. Notice what back in verse 30. Come now and hear what the message is which comes forth from Jehovah. They admitted his message from, from, was from God, but they still weren't doing what he told them to do. Verse 33, so when it comes to pass, as surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been in their midst. Anybody have any thoughts or comments on chapter 33? It's kind of sad the number of people that I have studied with over the years who talk like they understand what to do to obey the gospel and then they don't do it. Figuratively speaking, their, their toes are hanging over the waters of the baptistry and they turn around and walk away over and over again. They go home and talk to somebody a spouse, friend, family member, somebody, and they talk them out of it. Chapter 34, God directs his attention to the leaders, whom here he calls the shepherds. Shepherd is one of the oldest metaphors that the Bible uses for God. Way back in Genesis chapter 48, and verse 15. Jacob refers to God as his shepherd. There are others, even in the Old Testament, that are referred to as shepherds. Cyrus, king of Persia. Moses, of course. Jesus is the true shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25, the apostle Peter writes that Jesus is our shepherd and our bishop. Shepherd and guardian of our souls, New American Standard Version. These shepherds here were feeding themselves and not the sheep. Look what he says in verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. If they eat the fat and clothe themselves with wool, what are they doing to the sheep? They're eating the sheep. Which, of course, is a metaphor. They're not literally eating their, the Israelites. It's not cannibalism. But what they're doing is they're taking advantage of them. They're exploiting them for their own gain. They were supposed to have been taking care of them, and instead they're exploiting them. He says in verse 4, Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Who is responsible for the Swartz Creek Church of Christ staying faithful to Jesus Christ? Who's responsible? Ultimately it's the elders. They are the shepherds of the flock. If the preacher is speaking, teaching something that's not right, it's the elder's job to take him aside and say, we need to study the scriptures a little closer. The bottleneck is at the top. 
in the church, it's the elders who are the shepherds, who are the leaders. The, word, the designation shepherd describes what elders do. The designation bishop describes the authority that they have. The designation elder describes the idea that they're older and more mature. These shepherds were only interested in themselves. Notice in verse 6, he refers to the, 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 the nation of Israel as my flock. I started noticing that pronoun my showing up over and over again. So I went back and checked, and the word my, and, and most of these, I mean, these messages in Ezekiel are coming from God. 276 times God uses the word my just in Ezekiel. As my flock, you need to keep my commandments. It's my sanctuary. This is the church of Christ. It belongs to God. That's why we've got to do what he says to do. That's why we've got to respect him. So verse 7, you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. As I live, God says, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. If there's anywhere you don't want to be, it's on the other side of God. <laughs> when God says, I am against you, that's fighting words. And God says, I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep so the shepherd will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. So in verse 11, God says, I'm going to gather my flock. The Israelites had been scattered from one end of the pole to the other. When Assyria invaded 130 years before, some of the Israelites wound up in Assyria. Some of them had fled to the, the west, and some of them had fled to the north, and some of them had fled to the south. And then when the Babylonians invaded, some of the Israelites wound up in Babylon, and some of them wound up in Egypt and further south and to the west and to the north. God says, I'm going to gather all of them together. And of course, he's also going to include the Gentiles too, right? And together, they're going to make up a new body, a spiritual body. And so God is going to care for them as a shepherd, a true shepherd should. Notice in verse 16, he says, I will seek the lost and bring back the scattered and bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. That's exactly what the Israelite shepherds should have been doing. The spiritual leaders of Israel should have been doing that, and they didn't. God says, I'm going to. But then he says, the fat and the strong I will destroy. The fat and the strong were those ungodly shepherds who were making themselves fat, and who were getting strong after over exploiting the other Israelites, the poor and the weak. And notice God says, I will feed them with judgment. If there's one thing I don't want to eat, it's God's judgment. We've, we've seen a similar metaphor before, right? The cup of God's wrath. Here God says, I'm going to feed you my judgment. When the Israelites whined and complained about the quail that they were eating and the manna that they were eating, you remember what God did to them? He said, I'm going to stuff you so full it's going to come out your nostrils. It's not a good idea to make God mad. So God says in verse 17 that he's going to judge. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Who else said that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats? Jesus did, Matthew chapter 25. You reckon he got that imagery from Ezekiel? He's the one that gave the imagery to Ezekiel. So maybe he's uh, basing his comments off of this. But he says, I'm going to judge between one and the other. Verse 23. We have one of the few messianic prophecies in Ezekiel. Ezekiel. 
Okay, in verse 23, God says, I'm going to set over them one shepherd. There has been many shepherds. God says, I'm going to set one shepherd over them. My servant, who? David. David's dead. David has been dead for almost 600 years. Who is Ezekiel talking about? Jesus Christ, the son of David, the descendant of David. In fulfillment of his prophecy, he gave to King David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So God says, I'm going to have one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself. He's not going to hire people to feed them. He's going to feed them himself. And he will be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, I know Annette is watching class tonight on uh, live stream, and Annette asked me who the prince was in chapter 44, verse 3. So, Annette, this word prince here in this text is the same word as prince in chapter 44, verse 3. The prince in chapter 44, verse 3, and we'll get to that when we talk about the temple, but that's a reference to Jesus Christ. It's a promise of the coming of the son of David who's going to be the shepherd over God's people. And notice in verse 25, God says, I'm going to make a covenant of peace with them. This is a new covenant. The references to the new covenant in the New Testament tend to rely on Jeremiah's prophecy from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. But Jeremiah wasn't the only one who talked about a new covenant. Here there's going to be a new covenant, a covenant of peace, a covenant that provides full and complete and spiritual forgiveness of sins once and for all. And God says his people will live securely in the wilderness. He says, I will make them in the places around my hill a blessing and I will cause showers to come down in their season and there will be showers of blessings. Don't we have a song that uses that expression? Y'all want me to sing it for you? No, you don't. <laughs> there shall be showers of blessings. Probably in this songbook, you can look it up. And God says, when I do all of this, they will know that I am the Lord. Look there at verse 27. Verse 30. When I do this, they will know that I am the Lord. And I am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God. So once God brings Israel back to the promised land, after they've repented of their sins, that's Daniel chapter 9, after they've repented of their sins, they're going to come back home, back to the promised land. God's going to gather them up. He's going to invite the Gentiles into his body of people with this new, this new covenant. And there's going to be one shepherd over them, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And of course, that one body is in the New Testament called the church. The church of God in Christ the people who belong to God through Jesus Christ. So that's this prophecy, this promise from Ezekiel here in chapter 34. Anybody have any questions or comments on chapter 34? Chapter 35 is a short chapter. Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Amen. Yep. Satan can't steal the flock if he can't steal the elders. Because they're the they're the line of defense. Now the congregation also has a responsibility, right? You've got a copy of God's word in your hands. So you also need to challenge the elders to stick with what the scriptures say. Chapter 35, prophecy against Edom. Ezekiel, again, has already rebuked Edom back in chapter 25. Why does he do it again? And why does he do it here? Remember what's going on. Babylon has now not just invaded Israel, but now they've overtaken Jerusalem. The city has fallen. The temple is destroyed. And now Edom is about to run over the land 
and take over the land. Jump over to chapter 36. Now again, Josh is going to take care of chapter 36 next week. But look at verse 2 of chapter 36. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, and so forth. So that enemy who says, aha, who says this, this is an everlasting possession, has become our possession, that enemy is likely Edom. And so the reason why Ezekiel is rebuking Edom at this point is because Edom is about to try to take over the promised land for themselves. And so that's why Ezekiel is rebuking them again. And in fact, if you look in verse 10 of chapter 35, chapter 35, verse 10, speaking to Edom, Ezekiel says, because you have said these two nations and these two lands, talking about Israel and Judah, these two lands will be mine and we will possess them, although Jehovah was there. So again, this is the reason why Ezekiel is rebuking Edom here at this time and at this place. Now, Obadiah... The prophet Obadiah, the little minor prophet Obadiah, that's 21 verses long. It's easy to jump over that prophecy. He preached solely to the nation of Edom. Jonah preached solely to the nation of Assyria. Nineveh, Assyria's capital. Obadiah preaches directly to Edom. And he criticizes Edom primarily because of its pride, its arrogance, refusing to acknowledge that Israel were their cousins and they should have respected them and certainly respected their God. So back to chapter 35, verses 3 and 4. God says to Edom, Behold, I am against you, Mount Seir. Mount Seir is, a, is the place where the nation of, it was, the nation of Edom uh, lived on, on the top of the mountain range that ran along the eastern side of the land of Israel. And so that was Mount Seir. And so anytime you see Mount Seir referenced in the Old Testament, it's a reference to Edom. Mount Zion was Jerusalem. Mount Seir was Edom. So behold, I'm against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay waste your cities, and you will become a desolation. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Notice he says in verse 5, Because you have had everlasting enmity, and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of the punishment of the end. In other words, you helped Babylon out when they were invading my people. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God. And notice how many times he uses the word bloodshed in this verse. I will give you over to bloodshed, and bloodshed will pursue you, since you have not hated bloodshed, therefore bloodshed will pursue you. In essence, God is t saying to Edom, when you invaded my people, you, you satiated yourself on their blood. I am going to make you full of blood, your own. What goes around comes around. You attack my people, I'm going to bring you down. And so that's God's words directed at Edom. So God is going to make them an everlasting desolation, verse 9. Your cities will not be inhabited, and then you'll know that I'm Jehovah. Does Edom exist today as a nation? No. Now notice what happened to those who had moved into the northern kingdom of Israel after the Assyrians invaded. Stick your finger here in chapter 35 and turn back to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. And we'll read verses 24 through 28. Again, this, this occurred 130 years before. This is when the nation of Assyria invades the northern area of Israel and ransacks their capital of Samaria. Okay, and when they do that, the Assyrians carried off Israelites, but other nations that they had conquered, they moved those people into the nation of Israel to live in their land. So beginning in verse 24, the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cuthah and from Avah and from Hamath and Sepharvaim and settled them in the cities of Samaria in place of the sons of Israel. 
So they possessed Samaria and lived in its cities. At the beginning of their living there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they, so they spoke to the king of, of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have carried away into exile in the cities of Samaria do not know the custom of the God of the land. So he has sent lions among them, and behold, they killed them because they do not know the custom of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Take there one of the priests whom you carried away into exile, and let him go and live there, and let him teach them the custom of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away into exile from Samaria came and lived at Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. That's what happens when you treat God's land as if it's yours. God sent lions into the land to kill them. Then the king of Assyria was smart enough to say, bring one of those priests back, bring him back home and let him teach everybody how they need to respect Jehovah God. What came of that? What, what's the sequel to that event? We don't know. But it's interesting. So back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 35. In verse 11, God says, I will deal with you according to your anger, according to your envy, which he showed because of your hatred against them, that being the Jews. And so I will make myself known among them when I judge you. So I'm going to bring your anger and your hatred and your uh, envy back on your head because you have treated my people with disrespect. Notice in verse 13, he says, You have spoken arrogantly against me and have multiplied your words against me. I've heard it. God has taken note. And then he says there's going to be a desolation and then they will know that he's the Lord. Now let's, let's fast forward before we close out tonight. Let's, let's fast forward now a hundred years. Roughly a hundred years. Turn over to the last prophet of our Old Testament. The prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. So this is a hundred years from when Ezekiel preached. 100 years in the future, 100 years closer to the time of Christ. Malachi, God's prophet, says to Israel, verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord God, but you say, how have you loved us? Are you kidding me? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob but I have hated Esau, the forefather of the Edomites, right? And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, the Lord being magnified but beyond the border of Israel. So God is reminding Israel in the days of Malachi, 100 years after Ezekiel, I loved you. And that's why I chose Jacob over Esau. Esau didn't respect me. And I had to bring him down. And then Malachi goes on to criticize Israel for looking at their clocks on a Sunday morning, waiting to see how fast they can get out of worship so they can go engage in business. Really, it was a Sabbath, not Sunday, but the Sabbath. But he says, you're, you're just so anxious to get finished with worship so you can do, go do business. Do you offer your animal sacrifices to me? But anyway, Malachi is a different stu study for a different time. Anybody have any comments or questions on chapter 35 in the rebuke of Edom? I've made some spiritual applications as we've gone through the study tonight. Number one, God's watchmen... Christians are still obligated to sound the alarm if only to save our souls. We may not be able to save the person who's listening. They may not respond to what the Word says. But we've got to share them the truth of what God says if we only want to save our souls because God will require it of us. Secondly, of course, Jesus is our shepherd. Again, Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 25, He's the shepherd and the guardian of our souls.
elders serve under him. We are answerable and accountable to Jesus Christ. And then the third point is when men speak evil today against the church of Christ, they are speaking evil against Christ. When Saul of Tarsus persecuted Christians, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You persecute the church, you're persecuting Christ. And bad things are going to happen. It may not be in this life. It might. It might not. But God doesn't forget. Anybody have any other comments? So Marvin, just read two chapters for next week, 36 and 37. And then two chapters after that, 38 and 39. But then you've got to read nine chapters. Two weeks in a row, two chapters. And then nine. All right. All right, let's have a closing prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for your love for us, and we're thankful, Father, for your word and for the encouragement and instruction it gives us. We pray, Father, as we study your word, that it will strengthen our spirits and help us to follow you as closely and as best we can. And we're thankful, Father, for your grace and your mercy and your patience and that you forgive us when we repent. And we pray, Father, that you will. And we're thankful that you do. We're thankful, Father, for the blood of Christ that continues to wash our sins away so that we can stand before you pure and holy and blameless. Keep us in your care. And bless our seminar coming up, Father, and, and the invitations that we extend. And we pray that you will be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.